Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami I just came back from a retreat at Cloud Mountain, not Clear Mountain. We realized the names were similar too late. But I had been debating what to name the retreat, and I realized that my favorite things to talk about were, quote, all the unpopular Buddhist topics. So that was the name of the retreat. And one of the three talks, uh, there was Rebirth, Buddhist Cosmology, and uh, body contemplation. One of the talks I hope to bring here again, and that's Buddhist cosmology, because talking about devas is really fun. You know, many of us might dismiss this as superstition, but these are powerful teachings. And in the Buddhist concept of how experience manifests, we, the central equation is called itapachayata, this, that conditionality. And basically, it says that when this is, that is, when this ceases, that ceases. With the arising of this, there is the arising of that. With the cessation of this, there is the cessation of that. So both cryptic and simple at the same time. But what it implies is there are conditions of arising and passing that are both simultaneous. So when you put your hand in a fire, it burns immediately. And so concurrent and temporal. So you uh, give to someone and then a few days later they return the favor to you. And the mix of these two modes of relationship lead to a chaotic system in the world and in how our experience manifests, how kama gives rise to the world that we see, this vortex of change. And a feature of chaos theory is what they called scale invariance, which basically means patterns repeat on wider and wider scales of experience. Some of you might know a Mandelbrot set. It's a fractal pattern. And it's a bit like when you look at, when you zoom in, the pattern is the same as when you zoom out and out and out. This feature of scale invariance is central to practice because what it means is the same patterns that manifest in our meditations as small habits, little things we brush aside, are also the habits that on the wider scale, because of scale invariance, dominate our lives. And if we get the chance to influence them at the micro level when we're on the cushion, then it softens and tames them in the wider scope of our interaction with the world. So one of the key moments of insight in meditation happens when we begin to sit and we get so frustrated at how we can't control the breath, or begin to dive into self-recrimination over our inability to calm ourselves down, or how we distract ourselves. And then this moment where you realize that the exact way you're trying to control the breath is how you try to control your loved one. And the way you're berating yourself for not being able to calm your mind is exactly how you tear yourself apart over not being a good enough father, or how you keep falling asleep in meditation is how you keep trying to zone out from a life which might feel in some ways a bit dissatisfying. And then when you understand that these are such deep patterns, they don't become you being a bad meditator, they become you seeing clearly at this micro level 
these patterns which truly have control over our hearts and cause so much damage. And if we get a chance to confront and work with them and soften them on the cushion, then that ripple plays out into the wider landscape of our being. This is scale invariance, the fractal repeated, softened, dissolved. Where it plays into Buddhist cosmology is, in Buddhism, the cosmos is a reflection of the mind, and the mind is a reflection of the cosmos. The same uh, angels and hell beings and ghosts which are spoken about in the texts are the same or are analogous to the angels and the ghosts and the hell beings of our hearts day to day. So there's this great, a wonderful sutta where a man goes to a pond and he sees this band of asuras, which are uh, like the titans, pop out of a lotus and jump into another lotus. And then a band of devas, angels, pops out of the lotus and chases them into the other lotus. And he goes to the Buddha and he says, that was really weird. And the Buddha says, there's a lot of stuff you don't know. <laughs> so first, it's important to say we come to Buddhism often with the idea of this sterile, secular teaching. And it's important to see that in Buddhism, a key difference between this and many faith-based religions is you are not required to believe in these things to practice Buddhism. It is not a binary of belief. The Buddha says that one protects truth by saying, uh, if I have faith in something, you say, I have faith in this. And if you believe in something because it's part of the lineage of teaching, you say, I believe in this because it is part of a lineage of teaching. But you do not yet come to the conclusion, only this is true, everything else is false. This is Buddhist humility. And it's the route to world peace because we can all kind of say, yeah, we don't really know actually, but this is a working hypothesis. And in the meantime, the Buddha taught the handful of leaves, suffering and the end of suffering. And people pushed him for answers on the beginning of the universe, on the workings of Kama, on what happens to an enlightened being after death. And time and again he said, did I tell you, if you come and ordain with me, I will teach you these things? And the confronting monk said, no, no, you didn't. And he said, I taught you. I said, come and ordain with me, and I will teach you suffering and the end of suffering. So whether or not we believe in this whole realm, all these things that I'm about to speak about, uh, we can still practice well. We can still meditate. And we can use these as images for what manifests in the heart. That being said, the Buddha, uh, we come often to Buddhism thinking we've escaped from a fairly colorful cosmology of some other religion. And little do we know, uh, the Buddhists have the most colorful cosmology of all, perhaps. Uh, we have angels, heavenly beings, hell beings. We have nagas, thunderbirds, and a bunch of other wonderful color. A lot of this comes from the commentaries, so it's not from the Buddha himself, but some of it is from the Buddha himself, and he certainly spoke about these beings. And I find it's a beautiful way to look at the mind um, in terms of practical day-to-day -day application. So Longpore Sumedho says, it's useful to imagine your mind states as breeds of dog. So we all have our inner chihuahua kind of shivering in the corner. We have our Rottweiler. We have our golden retriever. And this is a way of doing that, but way more fun because we have, this is a very variegated cosmology, but every single mind state maps on to a realm. These are different frequencies we pass through day after day and life after life. So we'll begin with the most relevant, or one of them, the ghost realm. Oh no, first, the Buddha gives this beautiful analogy for the realms in the Mahasihananda Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 12, the Middle Link Discourses. And he says, hell is a pit of glowing coals. The animal realm 
is a cesspit. The ghost realm is like a man dying of thirst under the hot sun, coming to a barren tree with a modicum of shade trying to find respite. The human realm is a lush tree where this man dying of thirst, burning under the sun, can come and rest under shade. The heaven realms are mansions, cool, brocaded, large. Uh, this is an exact quote. Um, and then Nibbana awakening is an oasis, a pond of water where one drinks and lies down on the bank. And before moving on from that analogy, it's worth noting that the man in the, each of those analogies is starving for water, dying of thirst. And even though every realm above the ghost realm provides some measure of shade and coolness, the only place he actually finds water is awakening. All the others are just pit stops or distractions. But the ghost realm, it's in the middle, right below the human realm, but it's so relevant because it's where so many of us wander and rattle around through much of our lives. And these are called the pretas. I think they're best illustrated first in an image that is often used to depict the hungry ghosts, as we call them. These beings with huge bellies, hungry, but with a pinhole mouth because they're never able to drink or eat enough. They're always starving. But another analogy is, comes from a story uh, I heard. I'm not sure if this one's true, but it's a bunch of monks wandering through Thailand. And they stop at a house and lay down for the night in a row. And the house is haunted. So because they're different heights, their heads are all kind of uh, at odds with each other, uh, up and down, up and down, out of uh, alignment. And this ghost sort of shuffles over and gets kind of concerned and tries to straighten them all out. So he pushes them so all their heads are aligned. But they're all different heights, so then all their feet are out of alignment. So the ghost moves around, kind of gets concerned again, and shuffles all their feet into order. But now that all their heads are out of alignment again, so the ghost moves back around. And I don't know if the monks were waking up or anything, but the obsession and the circling of the hungry ghosts, it's an echo of the human realm. It's of those analogies, you notice most of them are quite different, but the human realm is the lush tree and the ghost realm is the barren tree. These are an echo of each other. And this idea that the preta mind state is the obsessive one, there's something very comforting about being in a small closet you know well, of being in a gray household you've rattled around again and again. This is the mind state that obsesses and circles and rattles. And the way they say to treat a hungry ghost if you encounter one is to spread metta. They can't hurt you but to invite and spread and uh, invite goodness to them. The next realm down is the animal realm. And we have this image in the West that the animals are these beautiful things we'd love to be born as, but animals are constantly afraid and they're constantly hungry and searching for food. So this is the mind state that's scheming after food. That's one of the ways they say is the most animal mind state or driven to sex or these sort of deep base impulses. Uh, when they overwhelm us, that's the animal realm. Can we notice when we're in the animal mind state? Below that, the hell realm. And it's important to see these aren't punishments meted out from above. There's a saying in Buddhist circles that the mind gets exactly what it wants. It's just it wants the wrong things. And there's something, the Buddha says that to let go of a mind state, you need to understand its attraction, its drawback, and its escape. And until you understand all three, there's no letting it go. So with anger, which the Buddha said, anger with its honeyed tip and poisoned root. Honeyed tip and poisoned root. What's the attraction? Because it burns. 
So we know the drawback. We know how painful it is, how much damage it does. But why do we keep returning to it? What is it about the fire that gets us? And the sense of self is so orienting. Self-righteous anger is perhaps the most seductive drug out there. And this is relevant going into an election year, everyone. So keeping that in mind. But until we see, like, that's why I love that's why I keep coming back. It makes me feel solid, powerful. That's the honeyed tip. And, and before going to the hell beings, actually, it's worth acknowledging a near correlate called the Asuras. And these are equivalent to the Titans in Olympic mythology or Valhalla in the Norse mythology, although the Norse took that as heaven. But it's very interesting because in Buddhist cosmology, the Asuras, their angry god that constantly war with each other, they think they're in heaven. But every now and again, they look up and they see the angels and they realize that they're not in heaven. And then the, the commentaries say they swarm up Mount Sinaru, which is Mount Olympus in Buddhist cosmology, like ants. And they do boot battle with the devas, basically, the angels. So this is commentarial. It's not straight from the Buddha's mouth in terms of these like colorful details. But there's a lot of wisdom in that. We think in some ways anger is so seductive. You really can, and it's so convincing. It's so convincing when you're in there. It's easy to think it's heaven of a sorts. Not really in our better moments, but deep down, we wouldn't keep coming back unless we were finding something there that was profoundly attractive to us. And to notice that, to notice the attraction, and to know that we are, in that moment, a deluded titan, an asura. I know a practitioner who has a rule that if he finds himself self-righteously repeating something, an argument to himself three times, he knows he's wrong automatically. Something's off. And whenever that sense of anger manifests, you know delusion is behind it, the stain. In Buddhism, there's three defilements, delusion, anger and greed. And one practitioner once asked Ajahn Chah, I see anger and greed, but I don't see delusion. And Ajahn Chah said, you're riding a horse and asking where the horse is. So delusion and greed, or anger and greed are the two arms of delusion. So as soon as anger comes, you know delusion's right below. The hell beings are depicted as I believe the phrase is packed together as tight as mustard seeds in a jar. They're curled in on each other. And the depiction is of flame and suffering and darkness. And it's worth noticing when we hit these states of, of hellish, hellish existence. And it's worth noticing also that there comes a point in practice where those realms no longer touch one in the same way. On the cycle of dependent origination, which is this detailed link of 12 psychological chains and chains of being that the Buddha said gave rise to birth, the final one after birth is sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And I've mentioned this before, but Ajahn Punadamo uh, says, you know, people come to you Buddhist and say, you Buddhist, you're so depressing. All you talk about is suffering. And he says, that's not true. We also talk about pain, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. <laughs> but, you know, we only talk about these things to let go. And the path is a bright one. But I remember a point in my practice where, you know, suffering still applies. But despair no longer does. And to notice that when you touch that point where you just don't buy into the aggregates of clinging, the khandas, in the same way you used to, and you can't believe in it anymore. The story, you've seen through it enough times, you can't buy into the story enough to really descend to the hell realms and to mark that. When people look for the light nimitta in meditation, this sort of sign of light that can manifest with calm, Often they miss it because they're looking for a ball of glowing light. And what they miss is that their whole mental landscape has just slowly brightened. And so we change. The path affects us deeply. But it affects us in a way we've never really felt before. And so we miss it, even if others around us see. So it's important to take stock. 
notice that time maybe where despair no longer applies. Things still suck plenty of the time. Dukkha is still present. This practice is a slow boil. And I don't know a shortcut to letting go of the aggregates of clinging that we crave and feed off of other than burning ourselves some again and again until we let go. Ajahn Chah said that 70% of the practice is knowing we should let go of something and not being able to. So we're all holding these iron hot, ball, hot balls in our iron hot balls in our hand. And uh, a teacher who's visiting last year, Venerable Ponyam Sunim, said, you know, we try to put it on our shoulder for a while and it burns there. And then we try to put it the other hand and it burns there. And we just have to juggle it for a while before we're really ready to drop it. And just to acknowledge that's part of this is burning ourselves a little bit and having patience with that process of letting go. But that eventually we do. And our grip on the world is lighter and agile and caring. It doesn't mean a coldness, but it means a levity and an agility and a humor. And it means despair is no longer, we no longer descend to the hell realms in the same way we used to. There's the tale of a special bodhisattva in the Mahayana named Siddhi Garvis, and it's said he has vowed to release all the hell beings, and they say that whenever he encounters a hell being, he reminds them of all the good things they did until their heart grows bright enough to release them. I just thought that was very beautiful. So then there's the human realm, and this is, well, where most of us are, I assume. Um, we've had a squirrel get in here once, but I don't think he's here anymore. Um, and the hu human realm, no matter how difficult it is, it's a lush tree. And the Buddha said this was the most powerful place, place to practice because we are half God and half animal in a certain way. We have the mindfulness to self-reflect. We can hear the Buddha's teaching, but the immediacy of pleasure and pain and brutality and suffering are such that we can't ignore them. And that alchemy, that combination is so potent because it lets us truly confront dukkha and gain release. The devas, the angels, the Buddha said, though it's a pleasant existence, they grow heedless and they don't practice often. And then the Buddha or a monk or the Dhamma comes and teaches the Dhamma. And in the suttas, the Buddha says, then the angels grow afraid and say, oh no, we thought we were permanent, but we are impermanent. And the sense of carelessness. And there's plenty of analogs in a middle-class comfortable existence in the deva realms. So it's good to note that. And that in a real sense, the Buddha said that if we approach the difficulty and challenge of this human birth, the tragedy which is wound into it with right view, with a view towards liberation and practice rather than seeking comfort, this is the most powerful, beautiful, place we could possibly encounter the Dhamma. You are exactly where you need to be to practice with deep sincerity and fruit. And the difficult boss or the family member who's annoying you or the tragedy is exactly the place where you can confront and comprehend and let go of dukkha. This is the gift of the human existence is its difficulty. So to embrace, to be grateful for that as much as we can. The Buddha gave this beautiful analogy. He said that, which one will I? Okay, he said there's eight, this isn't an analogy, but it's a great sutta. He said there's eight unfortunate occasions to arise in the world. One is a Tathagata has arisen in the world, a Buddha, and taught. But one is born in a land of uncouth foreigners, unable to understand the Dhamma. I don't think that terminology would fly in this day and age. But the point is, you're born somewhere where you can't hear the Dhamma, so you don't have a chance to. The next unfortunate uh, rebirth is a Tathagata has arisen in the world, and one is born in a central province, able to hear the Dhamma, but one is stupid and can't understand the Dhamma, or doesn't have the faculties. Yeah, I'm going to get canceled. Um, <laughs> It's the suttas, all right? Um, <laughs> but um, anyways, the point being that <laughs> the, the next unfortunate rebirth is one is born in the central province and is able to understand the Dhamma, but one is wrong view. 
And then it goes on like this until eventually one is born in the central provinces, has right view, is ready to hear the Dhamma, but no Tathagata has arisen. This is the last unfortunate circumstance. And then the Buddha says, these are the eight unfortunate circumstances, and there is one fortunate circumstance. A Tathagata has risen in the world. We are born somewhere we can hear the Dhamma. We are able to understand the Dhamma. We are able to practice the Dhamma. What a blessing that we have encountered these teachings. How many people in the world get a chance to touch this sort of wisdom and actually be interested and have the chance to practice it. So understanding with gratitude that gift and that this is the gift of the human realm wound as it is with tragedy. This is the lush tree offering shade. In the deva realms of the angels, and their deva, the word comes from bright, radiant. And the Buddha said we should recollect the devas. And how you do that is you say, whatever morality, faith, generosity, learning, discernment, those angels have, even that is in me. And just the sense like those are the qualities that make one an angel. Uh, faith, generosity, learning, wisdom, uh, morality. And that this is accompanied with a sense of brightness, and you see this in people. When I was at Mopjon with my teacher in Thailand, um, yeah. Great. I said to my teacher, look, Ajnanan, um, if I could see a deva, I'd ordain for life. I don't know if you have a direct line to them, but uh, you know, if you could just let them know. And he said, look, you see devas every day. Look around you, look at these beautiful people. And I said, okay, that's a wise answer. <laughs> um, so to recollect though, the beauty and the people we see, see around us and to understand that as a human, we straddle all these realms we so often love the day of a part of ourselves. We love this brightness, and it's what we touch initially with the path, this flush of faith. But the power of the human realm is that we touch other modes of suffering too. And we are, we do have the animals in us. We do have the ghosts in us. We have these parts, and to hold them with compassion and friendliness and care, to not practice self-forgiveness is to not understand our own conditional conditionality things are as they are because how could they be otherwise? And it doesn't mean we don't work to change that in the moment, but to have compassion for where we're at, ghost, hell being, animal, deva, whatever that is. And the final thing I think to speak to, there's another set of four beings called the Brahma gods, uh, with, which have these vast radiant minds. But I think let's end today with Mara, and in the suttas, there's two main characters. There's the Buddha, and then the second most referenced character probably is Mara. And Mara, in the Buddhist concept, is this high-level deva. He's a rebel prince in the upper echelons of heaven. And he is the ruler, in a sense, of everything below him. He hooks everyone with darts of uh, sensual desire. But interestingly is he rules the devas too. He's also there in his realm as well. And I asked Ajahn Anand about Mara once. I said, you know, what is, what is Mara? And he said, Mara is the part of you that has pride. It's the person that comes to the monastery and offers and wants to be seen and be at the forefront of the front of the line and always be out there in front. And it's significant because Mara can co-opt all those beautiful impulses, all the things that make a deva a deva, the generosity, the wisdom. When that rush of pride comes, you know that Mara's come along. And that's okay. Like Mara's gonna be riding in the sidecar for most of us until we've attained awakening. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't do good. But when Mara comes to a monk or a nun or the Buddha, they say one thing again and again, and it's, I see you, Mara. I see you. 
And Mara then, it says, hangs with his, he sits down with his head hang, hung low, looking dejected, and then he disappears into a puff of black smoke. So <laughs> I love that image. Uh, but to see that side and to understand the power of swimming against the stream of Mara, when we want to jump into the conversation because we want to be seen, can we hold still and be quiet for a time and watch as that rush and compulsion dies down and know that on the other side of that, there's a quiet majesty and peace. And people will be baffled by this. You know, if instead of going to the front of the line, you go to the back. Instead of giving a gift yourself, can you give it to someone else to give in your stead? To go against Mara is such a beautiful and profound act. And there's almost always room for it. You see Mara poking his head out here and there. And to have compassion for that. I mean, it's just part of the scene just to say, I see you, Mara. And to expect that Mara will come up in exactly the most precious places, the relationship which you know is your most meaningful one with your spouse, with your kid, with your parent, that's where Mara will come. And to say, I see you, Mara. And to take the fact that things manifest there, not as a sign that that relationship is flawed, but as a sense like this is especially pre precious because this is where I can work with something. And Mara can be looked at as this internal part of us that wants to complicate and trap ourselves in the old patterns. And it can be looked at something ex as something external as well. And the final thing to say that it's kind of common wisdom in Buddhist circles that Mara usually comes right before you're about to do something good. It's almost, it's eerily common when someone's about to go forth into robes that something will come up right then. And when you're about to do something good, we call it the bow wave. If you know you want to do something good and something comes up to block it, you don't have to take that as a sign that it's the wrong thing, but rather it might mean it's especially good and that's why Mar doesn't want you to do it or that's why that internal Mar doesn't want you to do it. And I've heard someone say that every real good decision in your life should probably confuse about half the people in your life. And certainly my ordination went that way and I think most of our practice goes that way too. So just to expect Mara, and this isn't, you know, there's a beautiful story of Anattapindika, one of the main disciples of the Buddha, uh, chief lay person in giving, and he has this intuition he needs to go out into the woods and meet the Buddha, or, and see what's there. He doesn't know yet about the Buddha. And three times this overwhelming fear almost keeps him from walking out. And finally he, he, follows the deeper intuition and leaves and goes into the woods and he finds the Buddha and sits with him and that's his route to liberation. So good luck confronting Mara all and uh, thank you. Handamayam <laughs> Dhammakataya Sadukaram Dharamase Sadhu means way to go, and we are still working on making it sparkly. <laughs> it sounds a bit morose still. <laughs> okay, so um, we have a time for a Q&A, uh, and anything people would like to discuss, Zoom, in person or otherwise, just raise your hand or your electronic hand, and we'll run a mic over to you. Kim. Thank you, Ajahn. Um, in the cosmology, with the different sort of realms, um, are there stories, or how does it work? Like, if you're, you know, if you're practicing, if you're sharing metta to to parts of yourself or outside of yourself, is there like, do they move around? Can you can you meta a hungry ghost into the, do you know what I mean? Like, is there fluidity among the realms in the cosmology? Yeah, good question. Um, this is gonna get colorful, people, so. Um, 
<laughs> there's one story of a Brahma god coming to visit the Buddha, and uh, he doesn't realize he has to make his body uh, solid, so he starts sinking through the ground, and the Buddha has to tell him to like make himself solid. So I always liked that. I think that might be co commentarial, I'm not sure. Um, but the angels are very present, and uh, the analogy I've heard often is that it's like different frequencies of radio wave, uh, and these higher frequencies of the mind are like the devas, and their time spans are much wider. So I've heard that it's, you know, much more rare for a deva to come down and uh, kind of in contact directly, but it's acknowledged that there are, um, those are forces which uh, are around in Buddhist cosmology, and uh, devas and angels are, are present. Um, and the ghost realm, though, is the nearest, the nearest realm. And it's very common practice in Thailand and other Buddhist cultures to dedicate merit, which is where you do good and think of and recollect uh, some, someone who's just passed or dedicate it to a being in the ghost realm. And more than being like this esoteric economy, uh, the, the, it's sort of what I've heard it characterized as is it's inviting some being to be, identify themselves with goodness. And it's like someone just calling you and saying they've done something good in your name. It just feels good, you know? So the Buddha said that uh, a, a being in the preta realm can receive that. And uh, he, um, yeah, in almost every culture except American, there is ritual and days, Dia de los Muertos. There's ways of recollecting and not forgetting the dead. So, yeah, the Buddha said that that had real effect. And at the very least, you know, when we recollect the dead, often when someone dies close to another person, it's, uh, maybe Mara, who knows, but uh, we, uh, I really recommend people light a candle for them for seven days on their altar and just just as a way of spreading loving kindness to them. And at the very least, it just alters our own relationship to their memory. But no, the Buddha spoke about these things. And I was staying at a monastery once and a woman came and she said, I've had these dreams of my mom these past few weeks since she died and she's shivering in, in rags. And she's, she keeps asking for food and clothing. And uh, Ajahn Kalyano uh, said, She's in the hungry ghost realm. You need to do good and think of her and dedicate to her. And I said, afterwards, I said, Ajahn Kalyano, like I've never, I've heard about this stuff in the suttas, but I've never seen this in person. And he said, this happens all the time. Um, so, you know, once again, I uh, don't want to turn us off the, you know, the good secular Buddhists among us. That's fine. Um, these really can be taken as analogies, but yeah, it's, it's spoken of, definitely. You have to sort of hold it down. I can repeat your question too. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ajahn. That was a beautiful talk. My um, question would be it's more not like question. I would like to know how is your personal practice like? How do you incorporate the Buddhist cosmology in your practice? Thank you. Great question. Yeah, I mean these things are colorful to think about. Um, I find they're really useful in getting an image of the mind states. Um, there's a function of mindfulness which is putting things in order by naming them. So when the Buddhist gives us, Buddha gives us all these lists of the hindrances or the samadhi factors, it puts in order and helps us metabolize these different qualities of mind. But I find there's these deeper Jungian forces that kind of are best characterized and identified through these images and story. And so that image of the hungry ghost mind state, I find it so helpful to be like, oh, this is my preta self. Or when I'm in an animal mind state, you know, to see that and to be able to label it. Or the, the, the titan, you know, the, the asura. So I find it really useful to label. But I think the biggest thing for me is Mara. You know, um, it's, 
I don't know how Mars managed to fly under the radar of Buddhist circles so much. I think it's one of his greatest tricks, but he is everywhere in the suttas, and he's constantly depicted as we are in his snare, and the snare is composed of the sense, the, the chords of sense desire, but pride, you know, and seeing Mara kind of pop up in that pride, and to know that Mara comes in those places that are most precious. So in the relationship that I know is the most valuable one in my life, when it becomes difficult or I become especially angry in it, to realize like this doesn't mean the relationship's wrong, it means it's exactly right, and of course Mara is going to come here, and that's why it's this crucible of practice. So, and then just to say, I see you, Mara, um, or sometimes like, screw off, Mara. <laughs> you know, like I'm not always polite, but I think Mara is. I I really like seeing Mara. You know, um, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I have a, another follow-up question. So. Like something that I personally struggle with. Let's say you're over, over, sorry, overwhelmed with anger or some um, animal realm. How do you, like personally, how do you tackle it? Thank you. In right intention, which is the first of the Noble Eightfold Path, the Buddha defines it as the intention towards renunciation the intention towards non-ill will and the intention towards non-harming. And it's significant there that two of the three are about non-anger. And Ajahn Brahmali says that the correct function of mindfulness in a day is to keep your morality, keep your sila, and to not dwell in ill will. And there's something about anger which is so, it's, it's huge, it's constantly, it can be constantly with us. It can be the first thing that comes to mind because it's so, attractive in its own way, and we really can dwell in it. So the Buddha gives a bunch of tools, and I find you really have to rotate through them. Um, one thing I think is very important is often when we're angry at someone, we'll try to spread metta to that person. And really, I find a much more effective movement of the mind is spreading it to yourself just for how much it hurts to be angry. Just be like, oh, this is really painful. And it doesn't matter who you're spreading metta to. I mean, it, Rarely can they really receive it. It's just the feeling of metta is what matters. You know, it's for you. So holding yourself in that. Um, real good metta practice requires agility because it's such a sparkly object. We want to kind of shoot metta at a bunch of people, and we forget so often it's a much more humble act of turning towards your own pain and the first noble truth. The second thing I think is really useful with anger is to remember that the Buddha... Um, in the Mahayana, they have this concept of the bodhisattvas as these beings that can kind of split off pieces of their mind and send them down to incarnate as experiences in our life or the drunk on the side of the road, whatever, to teach us. And that the greatest teachings are from the difficulties. So I tell the story of this one monk I lived with who would admonish me about everything, you know, from how I, or well, most everything, from how I wore my socks to how I closed the door, and it was annoying. And, um, and yet I thought, you know, if, but they were all fair enough, like I, I could probably wear my socks better, you know? And, <laughs> and like, part of me realized, like, if this was a teacher giving this much attention to me, I would take it as such a great teaching and chance for humility, so why don't I just take this person as my teacher? And that was the best practice I've had that year, was him. And we came out of it as good friends. So really to like consider those people that are difficult in our lives as gifts and really try to hold it that way. And finally, I just, this is my, one of my favorite suttas is, well, two of them. One of them is the Buddha says to work with resentment. First, you can bring someone to mind with loving kindness, compassion, or equanimity. So he skips sympathetic joy because I know he thinks think he knows that's a tall order for someone we're angry at. Um, you can reflect that they're the owner of their own comma, and then you can just not bring them to mind. And that's a really helpful thing. In the West, we think we have to confront all these shadows all at once, but it's okay just, if you can't forgive someone yet, just write their name on a piece of paper and tuck it in a drawer for three months and just don't think about them for those three months and see if, if you take their name out after three months, maybe you can actually think of them with a sense of distance. So 
there's a lot of different techniques. Yeah, did that help at all? Thank you, it did. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, there's another great sutta. You can run the mic over, but uh, please. We've got a few uh, Zoom questioners as well. Okay, let's go for the Zoom. I think Charles was first. Good morning, Ajahn. What a lovely talk. It's so nice to see you. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, I would say, sort of basic and practical. I'm about to go on a uh, personal retreat for a week, only a brief week, and if you might have some general thoughts on that. I've already downloaded uh, some Ajahn Brahm podcasts. So I'm kind of equipping myself that way. But my second question relates to the uh, a comment in the Samyutta Nikaya 4710. Ananda, I have taught development by direction. I have taught development without direction. I'm kind of curious about the difference between those two. But also with respect to uh, direction, um, Bhikkhu should then direct his mind towards some inspiring sign. I'm not quite sure what that means. Thank you, Charles. Good to see you. Good to see you. So retreat. Um, you know, it's just useful to find the rhythm that works for you on it. Like you will have your own personal rhythm. Um, really make much of the times when you're deep in practice. Uh, and then if the mind is kind of agitated, it's okay to allow yourself a bit of time to, you know, to take a walk or do a, a little bit of writing or something. Um, I find having a bit of writing when I'm on retreat personally, even for 45 minutes during the days, can really brighten my mind. The Buddha said that the joyful mind is easily concentrated. So finding a way to, to bring about a bright mind, even on retreat, Sometimes just sitting and walking all day with no break is not the best route um, or doesn't work, and just you'll have to suss it out for yourself. Uh, I think it's useful to read a different angle on your main meditation object. So if you have been working with Ajahn Jeff breath meditation, try reading Ajahn Suchito's Breathing Like a Buddha or Ajahn Brahm's The Art of Disappearing or Shaila Catherine's Wisdom Wide and Deep. Like a slightly different angle on the same object can really invigorate things. Um, cold showers or a trash can filled with cold water. Big fan of that for breath meditation. Cold water's great. As to the passage in the Samyutta Nikaya, uh, this is today's daily sutta. If none of you are signed up for that newsletter, you should be. Reading faithfully, daily sutta. It's a sutta a day newsletter. It's great. So today's was the Samyutta Nikaya verse uh, Charles is referencing, where the Buddha basically talks about developing the four foundations of mindfulness with direction, which is where one basically observes the mind as scattered or touched with defilement, and so directs it to an inspiring sign, and then contemplates the foundations of mindfulness. And then he talks about development without direction, which is basically the mind is calm, and then the bhikkhu, or practitioner, just brings to mind the four foundations. And what I take that to mean is the Buddha gives another analogy in one sutta where he says one needs to interact with defiled mind states as one, as a cow herd, would interact with a cow before the rice had been harvested, tapping and nudging the cow to keep it in line and from getting into the field and eating all the rice. Um, one interacts with positive mind states as a cowherd would interact with the cows after the rice had been harvested. And the quote is, or something like, the cowherd would rest under the tree looking at the cows and thinking, there are those cows. <laughs> <laughs> so what I take that to mean is like, if the mind's really uh, defiled, you do have to direct it towards an inspiring object or tap it or keep it from wandering into the fields or the argument you've been through a million times. You have to give it direction and then develop the four foundations of mindfulness. But if things are kind of calm, you can trust it a bit more. And that's really important because often we get calmer and we're still trying to control every movement of the mind. And it's useful to know, like, you can trust it, like, let the cow loose a little bit. Try dropping awareness into the meditation and just trust it to kind of spiral where it wants to a little bit. Like within a domain, say you are trying to figure out where to focus on the breath and the body, instead of like 
clenching the breath at the nose out of force of will, drop awareness into the field of the body and see where it wanders, you know, and, and where it kind of spirals into on its own and trust the cow a little bit. So that for me is without direction to some extent. Although maybe that sutta is referring to an arahant, I'm not sure. That's that, very helpful. Thank you okay. so much. May you practice with and without direction this week, <laughs> Charles. We have to wrap stuff up. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, if people have other questions that are unasked, know that we have Wednesday evening live streams. Uh, and yeah, just uh, tune in 6 to 6.45 for the live stream. And then we have a great Zoom session afterwards, 6.45 to 7.30. And we have a chance to talk more then as well. Um, but we should uh, wrap up and maybe do the blessing braid. Um, yeah, let's read the chanting request list. So this is a request list we have online. You can find it under the support page of clearmountainmonastery.org. And if there's people in your life you know who are struggling, you can write their name there and we'll dedicate our practice to them as a group and chant for them every Saturday. Uh, Ellen Wilhelm, having a medical procedure, please spread care. Gudis Sachi, having rare genetic disease, baby aged five years. Gary Tribble, recovering from eye surgery, spread meta. And Andrew Patterson, recovering from a neck injury, please spread meta and wishes for healing. I'd like to add in there Geshe Dadul, Geshe La. Of, he's a teacher at Servasti Abbey who disappeared several months ago and they found his body. He'd fallen through a pond um, and they just found it recently. Uh, and he was an amazing teacher. I met him and really a gem. And I think his mind is in a good place, but we'll miss him a lot. And uh, his funeral or memorial puja is uh, tomorrow on Servasti Abbey's YouTube. So uh, he was a really special being. Do others want to bring to mind um, those that we should keep in our hearts. Kathy, who died the day before yesterday. Chris. Anna, that passed this week. Persephone, uh, Kim's cat, who's passing soon, perhaps. Les Les Leslie, who's bedridden, Axel's grandmother. Uh, via Zoom, Alfred Mannings for a positive rebirth. Alfred Mannings. Also, uh, my friend uh, Gloria, who's suffering a lot these days. Gloria. Jeremy and mother. Veronica, cancer. Robin, recovering from eye surgery. Okay. Malcolm, cancer. It's good to remember all these people. So we can dedicate the goodness of our practice to them together and chant for them. Um, let's chant the Buddha's words on loving kindness, page 37. If you're on Zoom, you should find the link to the chanting book in the chat, page 37. YouTube, it should be in the show notes. Now let us chant the Buddha's words on loving kindness. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, Peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety, 
May all beings be at ease, whatever living beings there may be. Whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world.